Hello everyone. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening for the Cambridge Union's Diversity and the Arts panel. Uh, my name is Kayoka, I'm the Union's Equalities Officer, and I'm delighted to be moderating this panel tonight. Uh, so the key question um, for tonight's event is, how and to what extent do issues of representation shape one's artistic vision? Um, the pa this panel seeks to explore the systemic inequalities in the creative sector and the role of art, both in its creation and its performance, uh, in the expression and interrogation of social, economic and community privilege, touching upon themes such as tokenism, marginalised identities and different social perspectives surrounding the question of diversity and inequalities. We hope for this to be a welcoming space in which individuals can express opinions, share experiences and reflect upon creative practice. So tonight we're joined by a very exciting lineup. Um, we have Ria Dillon. Uh, Ria is a visual artist and writer based between London and LA. Her work focuses on the Black British diaspora, having produced films such as Process concerning the management of black hair and the photographic series Sisters, a love letter to black sisterhood and friendship. Uh, we have Amal Said. Amal is a Danish-born, London-based Somali photographer and poet. Um, having her work featured in Vogue, The Guardian, and The New Yorker, she is concerned with storytelling and connecting with individuals who document these stories. A former Barbican young poet, she has also won the Wasafiri New Writing Prize of Poetry in 2015 and is part of Octavia, a poetry collector for women of colour. Uh, we also have David Charyandi. David is a Canadian writer. He currently teaches in the Department of English at Simon Fraser University and was the winner of the 2019 Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize in Fiction. His award-winning debut novel, uh, Sukuyong, concerns cross-cultural uh, family dynamics and immigration, and this is further reflected in his more recent works, Brother, and I've Been Meaning to Tell You, um, A Letter to My Daughter, both of which were met with critical acclaim. Uh, lastly, we have Ogi Abono. Uh, Ogi is a first generation Nigerian American thought leader and filmmaker who has focused on disruptive and inspirational storytelling. After having produced the films on uh, Eye in the Sky 2015 and um, the Academy Award nominated Loving in 2016, she made her directorial debut with the uh, documentary Invisible Portraits in 2020, which is self described as a love letter to Black women and a re education for everyone else. So, Ria Amal David Ogi, thank you so much for joining us. And it's such an honor to have you with us tonight. I'm really looking forward to this event. So we'll start off with a brief introduction from um, each of you to your creative practice and so on. Uh, Ogi, could you please kick us off? Um, yeah, so, I mean, my creative practice, um, it switches up depending on what I'm working on. Um, I allow whatever I'm working on to speak to me in that moment. Um, but for the most part, it really does um, start off with a lot of intention setting um, and breath work. So before I got into filmmaking as a medium, I taught yoga, um, restorative yoga and breath work and meditation. And so it very much so is a huge part of my creative process. So before I start anything, I always put myself in a very deep meditation and a breath work practice to really just ground my intention. Um, and then I just go from there. Um, so a, a lot of the inspiration that I, that I draw from comes from books. Like I, I read voraciously um, and I pull from that um, in the way that I create um, or the way that I start to cultivate my intentions before I start ideating on a project. Um, so yeah, my creative process varies. Um, it really just depends on what I'm working on. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and should we go to David next? Sure, um, thank you. Um, I have a, just a short uh, little thing that I've uh, written, so maybe I'll just read that and then save all my um, other types of comments, uh, live comments for later. Um, so I'm a, a black writer of mixed ancestry based in Canada. Uh, my parents were uh, working class Caribbean migrants of Black and South Asian ancestry. Um, my most recent book is entitled, I've Been Meaning to Tell You, A Letter to My Daughter. And it's a short personal account of what I see as the politics of race and belonging today. Um, I'm primarily a fiction writer and I've published two novels. The first entitled Sukuyan uh, explores the histories of the Caribbean diaspora through a story of someone unbecoming through dementia. My second novel entitled Brother is about youth culture, police violence and black life in a working class suburb. 
I've been influenced by writers like uh, Jean Reese and Michael Andache, but above all by black authors like Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Jamaica Kincaid, and Dion Brand. I try to write novels that are, uh, I guess, um, tight and uh, aspire to, I guess, a form of lyricism while doing unusual things with time and space. And I guess right now I'm finishing a novel uh, set now but stretching back to the late 16th century and uh, illuminating the often untold stories of black exploration in the early modern Atlantic world. Wonderful, thank you so much, David. That was a very valuable contribution, thank you. Um, and Amal, um, could we have your introduction next, please? Sure, you guys are all incredible, by the way. I'm looking at you all like, wow, oh, it's amazing to be here. But um, so I'm Amal. Um, I'm a poet and I'm a photographer. I did uh, my undergrad in politics and then I did my master's in art and politics. And so underlying in kind of all my work is this need to let women speak. It's like, I think it starts with the recognition that a lot of the women that I grew up with and a lot of the women that I love just haven't been kind of shown, like their true beauty hasn't been shown, right? And so that's where I start from. And so when I think about my mission, um, whether it was, you know, the poetry, because I began with poetry, I would go have conversations with my mom and my aunties and I would ask them questions and I would try to write those things down. And then when it came to my photography, it was about making them feel beautiful. It was about taking pictures of them to remember them, um, taking pictures of them so they could look at it and just be like, wow, that's me and I exist. Um, and so that's what it was about for me. Um, I guess thinking about how I, how I do my work and where my work comes from, um, I just love being engaged. Um, so like books have been talked about, I love reading, but also I love film. Um, I love watching film and sitting there and thinking about what I can write and what I can photograph in that way. And so I think I take inspiration from all those things. But yeah, that's me. Thank you so much, Amal, that's so cool. Um, and lastly, um, Ria, if you could uh, introduce yourself, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, so I'm Ria Dillon. I'm an artist and writer in London, and I guess to speak to the question, how I approach my practice, um, it's a very research-based practice, so I'm kind of always moving through text and through conversation and through discussion with theory and, I mean, just as much with, you know, prose, I guess. Um, I wouldn't say that anything directly aligns to the text that I read, but I'm very influenced by the research that Francoise Vergès does into the Capitalocene and race, and similarly with Catherine Youssef in the Anthropocene recently, but um, poetry and, and poetics as by Joan Retelick, and obviously poetics um, with Gleason are two, are two spaces that I like to inhabit and to think through and create via. So yeah, that's my short intro. Thank you. That's really interesting, especially what you said about poetry and poetics as a space to create. Uh, so yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, firstly, I think we should sort of start off this discussion with, I suppose, establishing definitions and um, laying the ground to ensure that um, our discussion will be kind of thoughtful and with nuance. So how do you imagine we can go about talking about diversity in the arts industry with nuance and with thoughtfulness and without falling into the language of tokenism? So, yeah. So I'm happy for anyone to kind of start on this. Uh, David, would you have any thoughts? Oh, um, sure. I mean, um, I guess I wonder if the first thing to um, to question. I, I see your point about uh, the 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 politics of the terms we use and how terms can open up a discussion or um, or close down a discussion. I, I wonder if we should be questioning the use of the term di diversity itself. I understand how it can be an important uh, leverage to, to speaking about um, hierarchies of power uh, in, the, in the work of, uh, that we do. But uh, the question I ask is, you know, diversity from what? Diversity from whom? And who do we leave as an unquestioned, um, I guess, um, thing or body of work? 
or unquestioned people against which we are a minor concern or an added concern. Um, I, I would never describe myself as a diverse writer or a minor, minority writer. And I, can, I guess that's a question of perspective. Um, I'm at the center of some sort of tradition, I would say. And even though I bring to my art, uh, you know, um, the, the world, I think, or the world as I experience it, um, I'm at the center of, of a tradition of writing. Um, and, and that center might, I might articulate that center in different ways uh, of, of black writing, of Caribbean writing, um, of black Canadian writing. So, um, so I, I wonder if, you know, um, you know, again, kind of just a, a gentle suggestion uh, from, from, the, from the very beginning, should we be questioning the use of terms like diversity, marginalization, or should we rather be using other terms to talk about uh, the questions that we face um, at this heated uh, and urgent moment in, in the creation of art today? I think um, I agree with that. I think that um, language is very important. And I think so much of our language is binary. Um, I think language is a place of struggle, but it's also meant to disrupt. And one of uh, my mentors who I study her work um, and I have for over a decade is Dr. Joy DeGruy, who wrote the book, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And she talks very much so about this illusion of inclusion, right? And how um, a lot of corporations or companies are really, are really just society in general has this notion that um, as long as you implement a department of you know, diversity and inclusion, it solves all the problems and it really doesn't, right? I think visibility um, is an entry point, but it's not the end game, right? And I think that um, it's really us taking the moment to really examine this society and what that really means. Sorry, my neighbors are going crazy. Hold on one moment. Um, Amal Aria, would you have any kind of thoughts to, uh, oh, sorry, never mind. Oh, yeah, did you, do you have any other continuous thoughts or? Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, and then this idea of that, that, you know, having a diversity and inclusion department solves all the issues. And I don't think that that's true. I think that it's very, um, it's not sustainable because I think it's um, problematic to try to implement us into a system that's inherently meant to oppress us and dehumanize us. Um, I think that's why you consistently see these corporations recycling folks when it comes to diversity and inclusion because it's, it's inherently not sustainable. I think the answer really is about us dismantling these oppressive systems and in its place building something or reimagining something that's inherently collective that's inclusive to us all. Um, and so for me, it's yes, um, really understanding the importance of language, but also understanding that there is no way to implement us into a system that is rooted in our dehumanization. Interesting, that's really fascinating. Thank you so much. Ooh, Amal, do you, were you about to speak? No, I, I completely agree. I think you, you said it so, so beautifully because in thinking about kind of, because when we think about diversity, I think the thing that comes to mind is numbers, right? They talk about kind of, we're having this amount of, you know, black people or Asian people that are filling kind of these positions. And if the narrative doesn't change, if any of the language doesn't change, it's just going to be the same kind of thing, right? Um, and, and for me, it's like thinking about, as a, as a photographer, thinking about being invited into spaces that probably many other black photographers haven't been invited into, right? But the type of work that you want me to do doesn't uplift me, it doesn't uplift any of the people that I come from and, and that have raised me and is still intent on not seeing me or any, anybody that looks like me. But it's like, as long as we have somebody that looks like you doing the work, then it, it's good. And I don't think any of that changes anything. Um, and I think, as long as, um, but this is the thing that I struggle with. It's like, as a young person who's trying to make it in these industries, right? And wants to make a living from it. Um, how do you challenge these things while also trying to make money, while also trying to feed yourself? Um, and I think for me, it's taken a lot of kind of willpower and being like, actually this work isn't gonna work in terms of, it just kind of doesn't align with 
the way that I want you know this work to be done if that makes sense like this me doing this work isn't gonna you know uplift anything and and working from that way um but yeah I don't know if that makes sense but you said that really really beautifully thank you so much Amal um Ria do you have any kind of thoughts to chime in on um, I think from David onwards, you succinctly put it to a T that it is this diversity term that needs to be taken out of the conversation and, and more emphasis needs to be on giving giving essentially the mic to as many voices within voices within the diaspora as possible. I think that there is not a general blackness or a general Asianness or a general Indianness. And I think that, that is a true diversity within the spaces there that needs to be, you know, spoken to. And and, and also um, OG spoke about as well, you know, having multiple people and multiple, yeah, it's it's all these different storytellings and clearly all four of us are, are telling our stories in, in many different ways from many corners of the globe or all the two of us in, in the same space across the ocean. I think it's, it's really exciting to not, um, have the same faces and not to have the same voices and to have as many new voices as, as we can um, without ever disrespecting those that have come before us. So we've all spoken about being influenced by so many great people and names that I recognize, some that I don't, and I'm excited to research afterwards. And I think that's what, you know, having all these new and additional voices is about. It's about strengthening the stories through, through connecting the communities that are already and have been present, but actually got stripped of their community from the very beginning of capitalism, hence the slave trade. Thank you so much. That was really thought provoking. Um, and in fact, um, I was just kind of wondering, I suppose stemming from the comments which we've kind of been making on individuation and um, I suppose kind of rethinking about where we, whether we ought to have like a center of discussion or so on. Um, in what ways do you feel, um, I suppose, marginalization um, in quotation marks can be redefined as, I suppose, individuation? And stemming from that, uh, how do you feel your background and your unique kind of experiences informs and enriches your creative practice? Um, so, yes, Ria, I was wondering maybe, would you have any ideas? Um, oh, the light's just gone out, but that's okay. Um, I think that, you know, there's not even space to think about whether my heritage informs my practice. It is part of my practice. It's like the idea of having Black come before an art or Black come before a narrative. It's it's always going to be there. I, I'm never striving to to separate the two. I don't think anyone would from any culture. I don't think that makes sense to me. Um, so it's it's never really a question that I have to feel like, needs to be answered in the sense that it's intrinsic it, it's always going to be there and that's what makes each of the stories being told so great because everyone's going to have different you know means of being brought up and that's that's what I talk about in my practice in terms of like an ontology of blackness versus the ontic everyone's ontic is going to be specific to your being and to your even the street that you lived on, you know, we can live in the same town, but the street that you live on can have such a different vibrancy to another street. And that's your ontic. But the ontology of blackness is something that I'm really intrigued in breaking down. And, and, and you know, it's, it's what I was just saying in terms of having as many voices that disintegrate this idea of a single blackness, right? Because that doesn't exist. Interesting. Thank you so much. Um, David, would you have any um, thoughts to chime in? Um, you know, I have to begin by saying, you know, every time I do um, an event or I'm slated to do an event, I, I, do, uh, I do sometimes get nervous. Um, not because I, I'm any more doubtful of what I'm doing in my creative practice than I, than I normally am. I, you know, I'm, always, I'm always wondering what I'm doing in my creative practice. I'm always wondering how to speak truthfully about what I do and speak with authenticity about what I do when I speak in front of an audience. But I always feel nervous because I don't know what kind of context I'm going into and who I'm having a dialogue with. And I've just breathed a massive sigh of relief. And I'm so smiling so, um, 
so huge, hugely inwardly right now because of what I've just heard from um, uh, my fellow pa panelists. So I'm, I'm just, um, I'm just so honored right now to be in this type of discussion because this is, uh, this can't be taken for granted um, all the time. I think, um, I think Rhea Amal and Ogi have have made a space for a uh, for a conversation already. Um, I just have to say that I, it's not, you know, it's it's just uh, I can't take for granted the 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 um, the quality of a discussion uh, anymore, I think, in this moment. And so I just want to I just want to signal that. Um, again, I'd go back. So if it's a question of marginalization, I, I, I again kind of maybe say uh, there's a writer. Uh, uh, she's a Canadian writer, uh, Dion Brand. And um, she was asked uh, maybe two decades ago, or maybe three decades ago, different contexts than now, but in many ways, the same context. She's a black writer. Um, um, what does it feel like to be writing from the margins? And her response was, I'm not writing from the margins. I, I'm writing from out of a particular experience and, and tradition. And, um, and she says something that's really interesting too, that really, really kind of touches on what Rio was saying. How do you, how do you say that you're writing out of a tradition, but not speaking authoritatively for it? That right? kind of notion of a singular homogenous uh, for instance, blackness or, or black Caribbeanness, how to push back against that. That's not what I'm. That's not what I'm doing. But I'm writing out of a tradition, and I feel centered within that tradition, even as I explore widely uh, the the influences and materials uh, when I when I'm creating. So I would I would you know again kind of humbly say the same thing that. Um, um, and, and not really working with marginalization, I, I, I would say, I would be quick to say, and I'm not apologetic in saying that um, Black artists face a racist gaze when, when doing their work. Um, more than that, there is the existence of anti-Black violence um, shadowing us all the time and, um, and, in, and in the world. Um, being felt all the time, and that is a that is a question. That's a question of power. Um, that that does um, that um, that shapes my art. But um, I, I I don't want to think of myself as marginalized. I guess um, I, I want to see myself in conversation with uh, with people who uh, see where they're coming from. Thank you so much. And I suppose it really times what you were saying at the beginning of the discussion as well, in terms of, I suppose, having your work um, stem from your own sort of, you being the centre of your own creative practice as the, as the artist in itself. Um, that's really informative. Thank you. Um, Awal or um, Ogi, would you have any kind of ideas in regard to um, how you feel your experiences have shaped you? Or um, as Ria said, would you feel that it kind of stems naturally and um, if so kind of how and yes how does it find an outlet in your art yeah I mean I think um, again I think language is so important and for me our ancestors really spoke about that when I say that I mean like Toni Morrison and James Baldwin right like Toni Morrison um, once said that language is a form of meditation, right? And when you understand that, you understand the power of words, right? And the Webster Dictionary, I believe, defines marginalized as relegating someone to powerless, right? And so I don't think that, I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to that label. I just don't, um, because I understand the power of words. And I think that we're not powerless. I think that these systems, these oppressive systems that are in place that we're navigating through society um, puts us in positions where we're voiceless at times. But at the end of the day, I think what's happening right now, which I think is so beautiful, is that there's this collective reckoning happening, right? Where people are remembering their innate power, right? People are also remembering the power of the collective. Um, and so that actually gives me a lot of hope. Um, because it also takes me back to 
um, something that Toni Morrison says, where she says, definitions belong to the definers and not those defined. And I think that we're living in a moment of time right now that's really highlighting that. Um, because one thing that this pandemic has done, if it's done anything beautifully, it's lifted the veils of all the things that we've been taught to be true, right? We're now witnessing and noticing that all these things that we were taught to be true are not immutable truths, right? And people are forced to really sit with themselves and also forced to really sit with a society that is not providing care for them, right? And I think that's how you see all these um, aspects of mutual aid happening, right? Like people confuse it and think that it's charity and it's not, right? It's a system of care. And I think that right now we're in this beautiful space where so much is being unveiled and so much is being birthed in its place, right? When something isn't working, I think you you sit down and you ask yourself, then what else can be built in this place? And I think that that's happening right now. So I think that the language that we're choosing to use in this moment, we have to be intentional with that um, because there's so much power in words. Um, and, you know, that ties into my creative practice. Um, like Rhea was saying, like, I don't go into my work thinking that I'm, I'm marginalized or that I'm voiceless or that I'm creating black art. I go into it knowing that, um, A, as long as I have breath, that I know that my divinity is non-negotiable. And so whatever I create is gonna speak for itself. Um, and so I just want us to continue to be in this space because I think it's so beautiful. Um, it kind of reminds me of like the roaring 20s. I feel like that's what we're stepping into right now, our version of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and I'm excited about it. I agree with you so much of what you said. I think there's power, right, in, in knowing kind of the mistreatment, the kind of racism, in terms of when we're talking about being kind of peripheral, right, we're not in the center. Like a lot of those people, if we're talking about, you know, whiteness and kind of the norm, a lot of those people kind of go through the world and see very little of what's going on don't see other people's pain in that way, don't see what people are going through, the injustice, the poverty, none of that, right? And talking about, you know, being on the peripheral and, and being black or, you know, working class and seeing poverty and injustice, right? Like going through and, and creating work from a place of understanding what people go through and compassion in that way and kind of not being blind to a lot of what's going on. And for me, there's power in seeing all of those things, no matter how ugly a lot of that is, right? Um, and I also think about, you know, in, in terms of living in the West or living in, in for me, in London and a lot of kind of the art that I, I that I love and has been really, really vital for me kind of being overlooked and a lot of the artists that I love that are black and are women kind of not being paid their dues and not, you know, put in these big galleries or given, you know, the money to, to live their lives, you know, the way that they want to. Um, I just, I think about, for me, there's power in being able to, wow, I just lost my train of thought. I just completely lost my train of thought. But what I'm trying to say is because I haven't been seen and my art hasn't been seen uh, and growing up, the people I love haven't been seen. For me, it means that as an artist, as a creative, as a photographer, I am more able to see others and to seek that out and see injustice and bring people to my work. So a lot of the work that I've done, I think from the very beginning has been about, I want to photograph mainly women. Like I want to photograph mainly black women. I want to write down these stories. I want to do all of this because I haven't been seen and because, you know, my story hasn't been captured in that way. Um, so for me, I think there's power in seeing injustice. And I mean, I, I completely agree. I don't come to my work being like, oh, I'm so um, insignificant. I'm so like, people don't hear me. People don't see me. I think I'm, I'm turning it into a power thing where I'm like, I see a lot of what's going on. How do I bring that to my work? That's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and it really makes you think maybe art in itself is a kind of um, producing art is in itself a form of power or as um, as a modern Nogi so thoughtfully kind of delineated a way of kind of you know, bringing these voices and making sure that people are heard. Um, and as David and Rhea have highlighted, it's so wonderful that we have a space like I suppose at this event, um, where we can really accentuate these voices and, you know, make sure that um, we're having these discussions. Um, but yes, so kind of stemming from that, do you feel that kind of attitudes are changing in regard to, uh, with regard to issues of inclusion and how can we go further? I suppose we've already kind of um, 
delineated how it, it's becoming an increasingly kind of empowering and welcoming space for um, for young um, artists of color and for young black artists and so on. Um, but how can we make the creative industry even more welcoming and um, you know really foster uh, genuine creativity? Uh, yes, if anyone has any thoughts. Um, I mean, I would, the first thing that comes to mind for me is funding. I mean, like I, I mean, I grew up, you know, working class, um, you know, my family are working class. And for me, the type of kind of um, work that we could do, and I think a lot of us can relate, was about being in a position where you could take care of yourself and you could take care of your family, right? Um, and from everything we know about the arts, like a lot of it, you know, doesn't feel stable all the time because there isn't the funding there for a lot of artists. And, you know, perhaps that is like a, it's a government thing. It's, you know, where you live, um, you know, but in terms of being young and thinking that you can make it in these industries and you can create the work that you love. And I hate, you know, um, for me to start it this way because it's you know it's it's such a capitalistic way to think about it because you want to begin by thinking about the love and you know who you're representing and who you're doing it for and what you're doing and the kind of work that you want to create and it's sad that you have to think about can I survive while doing the work that I want to do um so that's the first thing that pops into my head thank you so much Amal um David, Rio, um, would you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a way to make the creative industry more welcoming is to just create, right? Um, I, I tend not to ask for permission, right? I just go and do it. Because um, one thing I've also learned too, when it comes to like creative industry, whether it's Hollywood um, or these art spaces, um, they don't create the culture, they follow it, right? And so at the end of the day, if you know that, you know you hold the power. And so for me, I just go and create, right? And I implore other people to do that. Yes, you need funding and yes, you need support, but there's so many ways for us to get that, right? I think we've been very much so conditioned to thinking that there's only one way of doing things. Um, and once again, it goes goes back to realizing that like these rules that are set in place are not immutable truths, right? Like at the end of the day, we are experiencing someone's imagination on a daily basis, right? Hollywood exists because someone first imagined it and enough people believed it to be true and bought into that, right? We're on Zoom right now because someone first imagined it to be true and then enough people believed it and it came into existence. And so I think when you understand a, that our most powerful currency is our mental state, then you understand that at the end of the day, all of this, right? We're living in someone's imagination. So why not live in your own, right? One of the things that James Baldwin says is art is a confession. That's all it is. And so I think at the end of the day, we all deserve to tell our stories. We're all storytellers. There is nothing um, great about me that's not great within the next person that's watching this, right? At the end of the day, it's just about remembering your innate power and operating from that place. Because so many of us um, have been taught to shrink ourselves, right? To fit into this society that isn't meant for us, right? And so I think once again, it's really about a lot of unlearning that we have to do and then relearning what is inherently true about ourselves and what's inherently true about this society, which is why I think history is so important. Um, because for the most part, we're not taught that, especially in American culture, like we're taught revisionist history in schools, right? Like we're not taught the true history of American history. So I think a like knowing your history and understanding that um, leads you to um, remembering your innate power and then you start creating from that space. And so at the end of the day, it's just remembering that, that like these institutions that we look to for permission they follow us, like we don't follow them, um, but they literally thrive off the, the knowing that we don't know our power really. Um, and so they, they capitalize on that. And so for me and the things that I create, it's really about reminding people of that, right? Reminding people um, of their innate power, reminding people that they're worthy to tell their own stories, um, reminding people that they don't have to wait for the permission to do that. That's really insightful. Thank you so much, Ogi. Um, Ria or David, would you have any thoughts? I'd continue that and say community. Just look to your community for where and for how and for what and, and even for why it is that you're creating and that you're 
you you know you came to a creative practice there's, there's creativity in so much of the world it, it has to exist i mean what we had to contextualize this now you know the idea that artists had to find a new means and a new job in in regard to the pandemic was absolutely ridiculous there's art in everything i remember giving a really ridiculous speech when i was really young at school you know when you're choosing a subject and i, I chose to speak about how art is in everything and creativity is in everything and 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 Ogi so beautifully said in every one there is no greatness that's not in you that's not in the next person i think that was so so beautifully succinctly said and has been said in the language of so many people that you read and you you can learn from your histories and so to bring it into our present histories is, is a community that surrounds you and to to show your work to them to exhibit to them to to hear critique from them i'm always you know in studio visits talking about talking with my friend about this or with that and, and hearing how they think and how they have reverbed from me to come to a new place of thinking within my work. And that those people around you are, are your key, are they, they are foundations in how you can grow. So, so look no further to exhibiting to them and, and, and everything else will come. Thank you so much, Ria, that's, that's really insightful. Um, David, would you have any lasting comments to chime in? I just, uh, you know, big yes to everything I've I've just heard, and um, I mean, for me, the the thing, again, kind of, um, it's all been said far better than I'll I'll be able to to do it now. But um, this this act of of self centering as as an artist, I just think it's it's so important. Um, institutions and the creative industry as a whole. Um, there is a dialogue that we have with with them uh, at times to do our work. Um, but I think the thing we always have to remember is notwithstanding the fact that there are people within the creative industries and also within institutions that are well wished and are trying to um, trying to change things positively. Uh, these institutions are by their essence about profit, and about survival under their own terms. They're not, they're not about um, artistic innovation. They're not about the integrity of thought and art. I don't believe that. Uh, or if it's a, it's a type of thought and art that um, has exerted and is complicit with a type of violence that, that has existed for centuries. Um, and so the answer to me is, um, is yes, of course, to, to be, um, to, to, to yearn for a, a type of authentic trans transformation of these institutions and industries, but to, to focus, um, as has just been said, on our communities and on the, authentic the authenticity of our practice as, as artists. I mean, how often have we, have we been made to feel that what we are through painstaking effort and through great discipline and uh, and research trying to do in terms of form and narrative and thought, uh, we are told that that's uh, not quite what um, a, an institution or, or um, uh, the industry wants. But I think by, by doing it nonetheless, by, by understanding that um, uh, in that authenticity of practice is the only meaning as an artist, uh, we are doing we are doing important work. Anyway, that's just just my thought. Thank you so much, David. Um, and I suppose stemming from that, um, I think I'd like to pivot to one last question from us. Um, and perhaps this is in keeping with the kind of student audience or people around our age students kind of tuning into this event. Do you have any advice for um, young creatives making their way into the art sector? whether they be from, I suppose, diverse backgrounds, or I suppose more generally, um, what would your advice be for someone our age thinking about becoming a creative and um, making art? I would say to find something that you're excited about and to keep reading and keep immersing yourself in that field allowing that thing to grow naturally and not forcing it to be in any space 
you'll gain so much. And again, we've spoken about this, looking looking to those who've spoken before us, looking to those who've, who've thought about all these things before us and engaging with their questioning, engaging with their theories and, and seeing how you can formulate your ideas and, and your practice from that is the backbone of every practice. You know, don't listen to anyone who tries to say that they aren't inspired by someone. We, we all are inspired by everyone and every, and, and so many of our ancestors have, have such incredible teachings to give us through, through books, through films, through, you know, many, many capacities. And so I think find something you're excited by, speak to that, research that, read that, discuss that with friends, find the people that are also excited in that with you, and then, and then build from there. I guess more directly speaking, if you then see from that research, you know, contemporaries who are looking into that come together and, and, and create a, you know, a community exhibition, talk about it, have a, have a conversation like this of your own. It doesn't have to be an open platform, live broadcast panel. You could even do a live, you know, on Instagram. There are so many things that we today have in terms of connecting with people all over the, around the world, different time zones, different places. And, and so kind of set up for yourself and, and, and it will all lead from there. Thank you so much, Ria. Um, Amal, David, um, any, any thoughts? No, I, I agree. I just want to add on to what Ria was saying. I agree with that. I think it's also to um, redefining what it means to be a creative, right? Like once again, understanding that this language that we're currently using for the most part really is a language of the oppressor, right? Um, and so it's really understanding that and then redefining what that means for you, right? I think that um, the way that we use the word creative now is very binary. When at the end of the day, I think that every aspect of our lives are creative, like we're all creatives, right? I think when the way that we currently use the language now, people um, tend to put artists or like creatives like us on pedestals and think that, that there was something special about them, right? And that I don't have that innately in me. And I think that that's really the wrong frame that we should be looking at it through. I think that we're all creatives from doctors to lawyers to, um, to people who are creating visual or performance arts, right? It's just figuring out like what Rhea said, what you're passionate about and pursuing that, right? And in doing that, like you become a creative, right? I can't go have surgery on someone. I don't know how to do that. I'm not passionate about that, but that's an art to that, right? There's an art to being an author. There's an art to being a professor, right? There's an art to being a cook. So I think it's about really, um, like letting go of this framework of the way that we've been conditioned to see things in a very binary perspective and understanding that um, language is meant to be expansive, right? And I think it really kind of falls back into, I don't know if you're familiar with this guy named Edwin Nichols, who um, does this research and study on axiology, which is the theory of value, right? And he really talks about how when you think about Western culture, it's really rooted in this idea of member the object, right? It's really rooted in this idea about the, the acquisition of something. And when you really think about that, like that is what Western culture is. But then when you think about other systems of culture, whether it's African culture, Caribbean culture, um, Hispanic heritage, indigenous folks, it's always rooted in relationship, right? It's always rooted in the, the spectrum of how things are experienced. So I think it's really letting go of this binary way of thinking of things and understanding that we're all inherently creative. Um, it's about really figuring out what you're passionate about and driving that with community, right? And driving that with the history of what you're learning, not only about yourself, but the society that you're, in, you're embodied in, right? And like letting go of these limitations that have been placed on us to make us think that there's only a certain way of doing things and a certain way of perceiving life. I mean, my advice would be, to know that, you know, at the end of the day, the only goal you can accomplish is the one you don't go after. And so I just really want people to know that and to go after all their hearts desires, knowing that at the end of the day, it's all possible. Like we're literally living in people's imaginations right now, right? When you think about the constitution, right? That's someone's imagination. At one point, they thought we were three fifths of a human being, right? Until we fought against that. So it's really about understanding that every aspect of our society is us experiencing someone else's mental health when you really think about it. And we can challenge that because it's not an immutable truth. Hopefully that makes sense. I mean, that really makes sense. Thank you so much, Ugi. That's incredibly empowering. Um, 
Yes, David, would you have any kind of thoughts um, to turn in off a mile? Oh, just, uh, you know, just really briefly, and, and again, just a, a minor addition to what, you know, I just heard from Oki Maria. Um, but I guess it involves uh, taking yourself as an artist seriously, uh, discovering your powers, um, not, you know, um, not, not conforming to other people's expectations, um, discovering your, your own version of what it is to create art authentically, um, to, to be aware, to be aware of the world, to be aware of your, your place in it, um, um, be aware of those histories uh, and those traditions uh, and the, the great ones who have gone before you and, um, and the, great, uh, the great struggle um, to, to live well and beautifully. Uh, that's what being uh, an artist is, is all about, I would say. Oh, living well and that's really oops sorry that's I'm beautiful. Like, oh. yeah that's that's really beautiful all of, all of you have given such beautiful answers and I would only add to that um because I agree with everything especially the community and 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 writing or taking pictures with other people sharing work having conversations and I would I would also add to that forgive yourself for periods of not creating like forgive yourself you know when you're not producing work like it's okay you don't constantly have to be like, here's a new body of work, here's a new book, here's a new photo series. Like, it's okay, um, especially because we're in a pandemic, um, but also because you need periods of time. And of course, you're taking things in. And David, as you said, like living beautifully, like being out in the world. Um, and, and for me these days, that looks like walking, um, that looks like running, right? And being completely still and being completely okay with that. And last year, I would have really struggled with kind of sitting still and not writing or not doing any of those things. But um, yeah, forgive yourself for, for not creating. It's completely okay. Wow, that's so beautiful. And like, as someone who's very interested in art and creating myself, that's really empowering and inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, so I suppose we have received a number of um, audience questions. Um, and I think one which would probably be a nice one to start with is, um, have you ever, how do you feel about your art being, I suppose, um, hmm. oh, sorry, what is, oh, sorry, how do you feel about your art being kind of understood um, or potentially misunderstood um, when you kind of send it to the public? Uh, does one focus on getting a foot in the door or does one look to build a new space? Um, I'm happy for anyone to, um, who's willing to answer. Um, how do I feel about my art in the world? Um, I don't think about that, right? Like I, I create and then I present it to the world, right? And I think that the reason why I don't really think about that is because people bring to your experience their lived experiences, right? And so I have no control on how people receive the art that I make. Um, but for me, I'm always very intentional with what I make. So I know what the intention is when I'm making my art and I'm rooted in that throughout the entire process. And I just hope that it's received um, and that the intention is well received. Um, but I don't, once I let it go and I birth it into society, I try not to really just think about how people are receiving it. Um, Cause I know that, I know what the intention was when I, when I created it. And so I just hope that that's well received and I just let it go. Um, in regards to breaking into the industry, um, I mean, it's complex, right? Like, I, I think, yeah, like you want to break into it, but also I think it's really important to create new spaces, right? Like it, it kind of goes back to what we were saying about community, right? It's really important to create new spaces because these old spaces really aren't, um, they're not inherently inclusive, right? And so it's kind of, being done with in itself like when you think about for example the golden globes right like look what just happened with that like it was just revealed that the entire voting academy is all white folks and so it explains the reason why films and important content like i may destroy you was not nominated right because they don't really relate to that experience when you don't have people that look like the content that you're viewing on a board that makes those decisions then it makes sense why you know films like that or content like that is overlooked so i think it's really important that we start to create these new spaces 
that are inclusive to all of our experiences. So I'm not gonna say not to try to break into this industry because I understand um, the leverage that it can give one, but I also wanna just you know, nail the importance of cultivating new spaces. Thank you so much, Ogi. And that's really kind of trailblazing and inspiring. I really love it. Thank you. Um, Amal, Ria, David, do you have any thoughts? Or? Maybe, maybe Ogi put it so succinctly that you know, we all kind of agree. Um, one other question which has come in from the audience. So what is next for your art, just generally? And do you have any upcoming projects? And what kind of ideas, I suppose, have been percolating around lately? Um, I guess uh, what's next for me is, uh, I, I just like telling stories in various mediums. Um, and so for me, um, I'm exploring doing an art installation um, this year. And I'm also um, in the process of writing a book because um, I think it's important. Um, I don't like being put into a box and I know that like, with the film coming out tomorrow, so many people are like, Ogie, what's the next film that you're doing? Um, and it really throws them off. And I'm like, I'm not even thinking about that. Like, I, I wanna create an art installation. Like, I wanna write a book. And they're like, wait, you don't wanna ride the wave of, you know, being an up and coming filmmaker. And absolutely not, I don't. I think that filmmaker is an avenue that I will continue to explore as a storyteller. Um, but there's so many other mediums that I wanna also explore and cultivate and create in. Thank you so much, Yogi. Um, Ria, what's next for your art? Um, well, I'm in residence right now, actually, at VO Curations in Mayfair. So what's next for me will be continuing and finishing that residency to then have a solo show after summer. Um, but I think more succinctly, what should be next for so many people and so many artists is is considering the archive in in and around your work and in and around our work. And so I often say when I'm teaching to to the students, like bring your friend, bring your homie to come and like, you know, with their point and shoot and take these like shots of you working. I think there's, you know, there's incredible photos of Sengen and Goody and being surrounded by her friends, some of which including David Hammonds for that incredible performance piece under the the bridge you know in, in LA and I think we're so grateful to see those because she brought a homie to you know capture those moments and so I think you know it's really important for me to say to the students now consider your work archivable from the now consider how important everything that you're doing now is consider when you found that incredible writer or thinker or theorist and how great it was that you could exist with their work because of the archive there I think thinking about what Ogi was saying and in terms of how we're in this Harlem Renaissance period, which is what I've been speaking with so much with my friends as well now, well, we really do have to make sure that we are archiving and also in control of our archive and in control of our voices. And so that to me is really what should be part of the what's next of every answer to that question. I'm actually, um, Ria, I'm actually also working on archives right now. So it's really beautiful that you just mentioned that. So, um, so what's kind of next for me, what I'm working on is, for me, I'm looking at family archives. So I'm looking at, so I'm Somali, come from an oral tradition and kind of the things that are passed down are not kind of written down. Um, and so I became really obsessed with you know what else do we pass down right like when people pass away what are their belongings that we get and how do we know them and um, especially when you're really far away from family and losing like for me both grandparents I just thought like what what's left um and so going back to you know the things that are left for us it's a photo album and thinking about um how we remember those people and also right now I'm just talking to my friends and I'm talking to other people and about their memories of their family archive and all the other things that are passed down um, and that's going to be like a photography project um basically so yeah so I'm working on the archive I'm also just working on another photography just about bringing like my own um, friends and photographing them. And the focus for that is looking at and listening to 
you know, black Muslim women. Um, and for me, because when a lot of photography projects are, are done and they're about Muslim women, um, it's a specific type of Muslim woman. It's like mostly Arab. And so now I'm thinking about like, where are all our, you know, African Caribbean like traditions and, 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 you know, being Muslim and where does that meet? And so I'm thinking about that too. So that's where I'm at. Well, thank you so much. That sounds really exciting. Um, yes, uh, David, do you have any ideas? Um, what's next Sorry, for you? I, yeah, I broke it just simply because I'm, um, I'm, I'm also working with the, um, with the archive uh, as well. I guess my, my previous books were all, um, were all set um, kind of quote unquote now. And uh, I was trying to wrestle with the, um, you know, the urgencies and intimacies of, of now. Uh, but this, this book that I'm now working upon, uh, I think I, I mentioned it in my introduction, it, um, it looks back into a deep, uh, you know, potentially unretrievable um, um, set of histories, um, a, a deep archive, and that is, um, you know, of uh, the representations of of black life in relationship with indigenous peoples, Asian peoples, in you know what what people might call the uh, the time of the European Renaissance, uh, the early modern era, the quote unquote era of exploration, and so um, yeah, so it's a quite a challenge for me. Um, you know what what are the stakes in looking at these very, very deep histories that um, in, in some cases actually precede, for instance, these paradigmatic events like, uh, like the real height of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, how do we retrieve those lives of uh, non-white people and primarily black people in, um, in that phase of history? through these archival traces. Why are we, why am I looking at these histories? And I guess I, I, I'm thinking of work, um, as some people who have guided my work. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about people like Sadea Hartman, Christina Sharp, uh, Dion Brand again, I, I'll mention her, uh, but people who um, are not simply just telling a story of the, of the deep past, but um, but critically interrogating at the same time, why? Why are we doing that? How can we do it? Can we even authentically recover these, these histories? Um, and how can I then link those artistic and critical kind of endeavors with, with something like my own personal voice, which is this effort to try to represent the intimacies between, between people that, um, that I care about uh, now. Anyway, it's it's uh, it's. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but that's what I'm sure that's what I'm trying to do right now. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fascinating. Thank you so much, David, and I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to your um, coming work, and um, as I am to everyone else's. That sounds so fantastic. Um, and I suppose we've got sort of three minutes tapering to a close. Um, I think we might it might be wise to wrap up the discussion there. But um, Raya Dillon, Ogi Egbunu. Um, Amal Saeed and David Tariandi, thank you very much for what has been such a fascinating discussion and um, a really kind of inspiring and kind of welcoming sort of space uh, to talk about creative practice. Thank you everyone who's been watching on our YouTube live stream and please look forward to our next event by the COVID Genius. Thank you so much. <laughs>